Here are the top 10 most important factoring methods that you need to know. Method number one, common factoring. Before I teach you any specific factoring methods, it might be good to get a broader definition of what factoring is. Factoring is the process of breaking down an expression into a product of simpler expressions called factors. So basically factoring an expression means taking an expression that is written in standard form as a sum or difference of terms and rewriting it in a factored form where it is a product of factors. And there are lots of different factoring methods that can get an expression from standard form to factored form. The first of which we want to look at is common factoring. Common factoring is the process of factoring out the greatest common factor from all of the terms in an expression. And when common factoring something out, the operation we're going to use is division. So you can associate factoring with dividing. And now let me show you three examples of common factoring so you can see how it works. In this first example, I have this expression 4x plus 8. This is a sum of two terms. In order to factor it, I have to find the greatest common factor between these two terms, which means I need to find the biggest number that divides evenly into both 4 and 8. Well, the numbers that divide evenly into 4, which we call the factors of 4, are 1, 2, and 4. And the numbers that divide evenly into 8, the factors of 8, are 1, 2, 4, and 8. The biggest number in common between those two lists is 4 making 4 the greatest common factor of those two terms. So we can common factor this expression by removing the greatest common factor of 4 and writing that as our first factor in our product. And then to get the second factor in the product, I have to divide the original expression by the 4 that we common factored out. So a couple things to notice here. Number one, I haven't changed the value of my original expression. It's still just equal to 4x plus 8 because you should notice that the 4x plus 8 is being multiplied by 4 and being divided by 4. Those operations are opposites of each other, so they just cancel out. But we're not actually going to cancel them. We want to leave this in factored form. It's now written as a product of two factors. I have my first factor and my second factor. But what we want to do is simplify this second factor. Notice both terms in the numerator are being divided by 4. And I know 4 goes evenly into both of those terms, so it'll simplify nicely. So as I simplify this, I'll leave my first factor of 4 outside the brackets. And then inside the brackets, I'll do my two divisions. 4x divided by 4 is x, plus 8 divided by 4 is 2. So this is my simplified factored form that is equivalent to the original standard form. 4 multiplied by x plus 2. If you imagine distributing that 4 to both terms, you could see that it's equal to 4x plus 8. Now let's try a second example that's a little bit harder. In example 2, I see that I have a difference of two terms. I want to rewrite it as a product of factors. So using the method of common factoring, I want to look at both of the terms and divide out the greatest common factor between those two terms. So I'll start by looking at the coefficients of those terms, 15 and 20. The biggest number that divides evenly into both 15 and 20 is 5. So 5 will be part of the first factor that I divide out. And then also notice, both terms have a variable in common. They both have powers of x. When that happens, you can common factor out the power of x with the smaller exponent. So my greatest common factor will be 5x squared. And now what I have to do is divide my original expression by the greatest common factor of 5x squared that I'm factoring out. And now that it's written as a product of two factors, all I have left to do is simplify this second factor. So I'll leave my first factor of 5x squared, and then inside the brackets, I'll do both of my divisions. I have to do 15x to the 6 divided by 5x squared. Well, 15 divided by 5 is 3. And when dividing the powers of x, x to the 6 divided by x squared, using my exponent rules, I know I keep the base of x and subtract the exponents to get a new exponent of 4. Minus, I now have to do 20x squared divided by 5x squared, which is going to be equal to 4. 
Let me make a bit of room and let's do one more final example that involves more terms. Notice in this standard form expression, we have one, two, three terms. So when common factoring this expression, I need to remove the greatest common factor between all three terms. I'll start by looking at their coefficients, the 18, negative 24, and 30, and notice that the biggest number that divides evenly into all three of those numbers is six. So part of the greatest common factor that I'm going to factor out is six. But I also have to check do all three terms share any variables. Well, all three terms have powers of x. I can factor out the power of x that has the smallest exponent, which is this one here, x squared. So x squared will be part of my greatest common factor. And then do all three terms have a power of y? Well, the first two do, but the last term does not. So I can't remove y as part of my greatest common factor, which means that 6x squared is my greatest common factor. To get the second factor in my factored form expression, I just have to divide the original expression by this 6x squared that I'm factoring out. And then all I have left to do is simplify inside this second factor. So I'll rewrite my first factor, and then I have to now divide all three of these terms by 6x squared. My first term divided by 6x squared is 3xy squared minus the second term divided by 6x squared would be 4y cubed. And my last term divided by 6x squared would be 5x squared. And now that you know how to use this method of common factoring, this is always the first thing you should try to do whenever factoring any type of expression. Factoring method number two, factoring by grouping. I'll do two examples here to show you what this method looks like. And while we do these two examples, I'll explain to you the method of factoring by grouping. Now, if we focus on example one, if we look at all four terms in this expression, you'll notice that there is no common factor between all four terms other than one. So that means common factoring is not going to allow us to write this as a product of factors. So what we do instead is we divide these four terms into two separate groups. We can consider the first two terms a group, and the last two terms are a separate group. And then what we want to do is separately remove a common factor from each of these two groups. So if I look at this first group, you should notice that we could common factor out a 2x. So I would put a factor of 2x out front, and then divide both of these terms by the 2x that I'm factoring out. And when I divide both of these terms by 2x, it will simplify to x plus 3. Then I look at my second group, and I notice that I could common factor out a 3 from both of those terms. So I'll common factor out a positive 3, and then in brackets, I need to divide both terms by the 3 that I'm factoring out. When I divide these terms by three, I see that it simplifies to x plus three. And now you should notice that the two terms that are separated by this addition sign, they have an x plus three in common. They have a common binomial. So what I can do is I can common factor out this common binomial of x plus three from both terms. So I'll remove x plus three as my first factor, and then to get my second factor, I have to divide this entire expression by this binomial of x plus 3 that I'm factoring out. And it might be easier for you to understand if I rewrite this so that you can see that both of these terms are being divided by x plus 3. And when you divide both terms by x plus 3, these factors of x plus 3 cancel, which leaves us with a final factored form of x plus 3 as our first factor, and then inside the second factor, all we have left is 2x plus 3. And this is our final factored form. It's a product of these two factors. So this last bullet point that I should have written down as our last step, what we did right here is we common factored out this common binomial from both terms. Now there are a couple things I want you to know about factoring by grouping. You can only try it when your original expression has an even number of terms because that allows you to make two groups of equal sizes. And another thing to know is that factoring by grouping doesn't always work. If you look at the last step, it says factor out the common polynomial. Well, 
what would happen if these polynomials were not the same? We wouldn't be able to common factor them out, which would mean that the method of factoring by grouping would not be working. So you'll know factoring by grouping is working if you get this common binomial after you remove a common factor from each of your two groups. Now looking at example two, this one's a good reminder that we should always check for a common factor before trying any other factoring methods. Looking at all four terms, I notice that three divides evenly into all four of those terms. So what I could do is I could divide out a common factor of three from all four terms. And now inside of the brackets here, I have four terms, which means I may be able to factor this further if I try the method of factoring by grouping. I can put the first two terms in a group and the last two terms in a separate group, and then I'll divide out a common factor from each of those two groups. This factor of three is just gonna stay out front for the rest of this question. And from this first group, I can common factor out a 5a. And then from the second group, there's no number bigger than one that divides evenly into both of these terms. But whenever the first term in your group is a negative, you want to at least common factor out a negative one. So I'll remove negative one as a common factor from my second group. And then when I divide both of these terms by negative one, I get 7b minus 6. Notice that I have two terms that have a common binomial. So what I can do is I can factor out that 7b minus 6 from both terms. I'll still write that 3, and then I'll remove that 7b minus 6 as a common factor. And then when I divide both of these terms by 7b minus 6, the 7b's minus 6 will cancel out and I'm left with 5a minus one as my second factor. And there we have it, there is the final factored form of this original expression. Factoring method number three, factoring a quadratic trinomial where the a value is one. So let me start by showing you what a quadratic trinomial looks like. It looks like this, where we have a sum of three terms, ax squared plus bx plus c. You'll be able to recognize a quadratic function because the highest exponent on our variable x is a 2. And these a, b, and c values are placeholders for any real number. But in this section of the video, we're going to focus in on what if the a value, the leading coefficient of the quadratic function, is equal to 1. So I could erase this a value, and you can imagine that there is a leading coefficient of 1 in front of that x squared. And what I want to do is show you the rule for converting the standard form quadratic function into an equivalent factored form quadratic function. So I can split this quadratic into two factors, where at the start of each of those two factors is an x term, and to each of those x's, we have to add two constants, an m and an n. And these m and n values have a special relationship with the b and c values in the standard form quadratic. If you were to add the m and the n values together, they would be equal to the b value that's in the standard form quadratic. And if you were to multiply the m and n values together, they would be equal to the c value that's in the standard form quadratic. So to get a standard form quadratic that has a leading coefficient of 1 into factored form, you just have to find two numbers, m and n, that when you add them together, you get b, and when you multiply them together, you get c. So let's do a couple examples where we practice that. Looking at this first example, I have a standard form quadratic where the leading coefficient is one. If I'm able to write this in factored form, it will be a product of two factors, where in each of those two factors, they both start with an x. And within each of those factors, I'm going to have to add two numbers. And those two numbers are going to have a sum of the b value, 10, and a product of the c value, 24. The numbers that add to 10 and multiply to 24 are six and four. Six plus four is 10, and six times four is 24. So I know those are the numbers that I have to add to the x's in these two factors. So my factored form would be x plus six times x plus four. And if you wanted to, you could expand this out to make sure that it's equal to your original standard form expression, which it is. So let me make some room and let's try another example. In this second example, we have a standard form quadratic where the leading coefficient, the a value, is not one, it's a three. But what we can do with this quadratic is we could actually common factor out this a value of three. 
3 divides evenly into 3, 6, and 45. So we'll common factor out a 3 by removing a factor of 3 and then dividing all three terms by 3 to get our second factor. And now we can focus on the quadratic that is inside the brackets. Notice the a value, the leading coefficient of that quadratic, is 1. So I know that if I can split that into factored form, it will be a product of two factors, where with each of those factors, there will be an x to start, and then I'll have to figure out what numbers that I'm going to add to each of those x's. The numbers that I'll add to the x's are going to have a sum of the b value, negative 2, and have a product of the c value, negative 15. The numbers that add to negative 2, and when you multiply them, you get negative 15, are negative 5 and 3. Negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2, and negative 5 times 3 is negative 15. So I can just take each of those numbers and add them to the x's in these factors. So I would have x plus negative 5, which I would just write as x minus 5, and x plus 3. So here is my factored form version of this original standard form quadratic. So let me make some room and let's do one final example. Now looking at this third example, the structure is a bit different. It still starts with an x squared and the middle term has an x, but the middle term also has this factor of y and the last term has a y squared. We can actually use the same sum and product factoring method to put this into a product of two factors, but we're going to have to adjust our final answer at the end a little bit. Notice the leading coefficient of this is still one, so I know both factors are going to start with x, and I can find the numbers to add to those x's by finding a pair of numbers that have a sum of four and a product of negative 21. The numbers that satisfy that product and sum are seven and negative three. Seven plus negative three is four, and seven times negative three is negative 21. So I'll add both of those numbers to my x's, x plus 7 and x plus negative 3, which I'll write as x minus 3. But notice if I were to expand this product, I wouldn't get this y or this y squared. But if I put a y with each of those constants that I added, it would be exactly equal to the above expression if I were to expand it. So this is the factored form version of this original expression. And before we move on, it's important that I let you know that not all quadratics are going to be factorable using this method. Not all quadratics are going to have a pair of nice integer values that have a sum of the b value and a product of the c value. But if you can find a pair of numbers that does satisfy that product and sum, you can get it into its equivalent factored form. Factoring method number four, factoring a quadratic trinomial where a is not one. To factor a standard form quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c, where the a value is not 1, we're going to follow three steps. And I'll outline those three steps as we do a couple examples. Notice in both of these examples, we have quadratic relationships. The highest exponent on our variable x is 2. But because the leading coefficient, the number in front of the x squareds, are not 1, we won't be able to use the same factoring method that we did in the previous section but it will be similar. We still will be finding a sum and product as part of this process. But the first step in the process, no matter what type of expression you're trying to factor, is always to check for a common factor. In this first example, there are no numbers other than one that divide evenly into three, 11, and four. So I'm not able to common factor that expression. So we can move on to step two. And for step two, it would be useful for me to label three as the a value, negative 11 as the b value, and negative four as the c value. What I want to do in this next step, the general rule is you want to replace the middle terms. You want to replace bx with two terms whose coefficients have a sum of b and a product of a times c. So in this example, that means I need to find two numbers that have a sum of the b value, negative 11, and a product of not just the c value, but of the a value times the c value. So I need to find two numbers that multiply to three times negative four, which means they need to have a product of negative 12. And the numbers that satisfy that product and sum are negative 12 and one. Negative 12 plus one is negative 11. Negative 12 times one is negative 12. So what we need to do now is the tricky part of the question. We can't go right to the factors. We instead have to replace this middle term, this negative 11x, 
with two terms whose coefficients are negative 12 and 1. So I'll split this negative 11x into negative 12x plus 1x. And then the 3x squared and the minus 4 are still part of the expression. Notice this is equivalent to the line above because negative 12x plus 1x is equal to negative 11x. But because this expression has now been rewritten with four terms instead of three, we can move on to step three, where we can now factor it by grouping. I can look at the first two terms as a group, and within that group, I could remove a common factor of 3x, and then looking at the last two terms as a group, there's nothing other than a one I could common factor out from both terms, but I will write that one. And now I have this common binomial of x minus four, so I can common factor out that x minus four. And when I divide each of these terms by the x minus four I common factored out, the x minus fours will cancel, and I'll be left with three x plus one as my second factor. And there's the equivalent factored form of this original standard form quadratic. Let's move on to this second example and try the same thing. Step one, check for a common factor. Well, four, six, and 40 are all even numbers, so I know I can definitely common factor out a two. I'll start by doing that. And now looking at this quadratic inside the brackets, I see that the leading coefficient is not one, so I'll have to use the same factoring method I did for example one. I call it factoring by decomposition. And that's because we decompose the middle term into a sum of two different terms. But to figure out what numbers to split that 3x into, I need to find my product and sum numbers. I need to find two numbers who have a sum of the b value, 3, and have a product of a times c. So they need to have a product of 2 times negative 20, which is negative 40. The numbers that satisfy this product and sum are 8 and negative 5. So what I do is I split the middle term into a sum of 8x and negative 5x. 8x minus 5x is equal to 3x, which is why I'm allowed to do this. And then keep the rest of the expression the same. And now I'll factor this quadratic by grouping. I'll remove a common factor from the first two terms. I could take out a common factor of 2x. And then from the last two terms, I can common factor out a negative 5 from those two terms. So now that I have this common binomial, I can remove that x plus 4 as a common factor. And when I divide each of the terms by x plus 4, they cancel, leaving me with 2x minus 5 as my last factor. Now this factoring by decomposition would work if the a value was 1, but it would be a lot of unnecessary steps. You're only required to do this method if the a value is not 1. Factoring method number 5. How to factor a difference of squares. There's a special rule that says if you have a difference of two squares, so let's say a squared minus b squared, you're able to rewrite that expression in factored form as a product of a minus b times a plus b, where these a's and b's are just the terms that are being squared in the original expression. So let's do a few examples where we have a difference of squares. Now, before we do these three examples, it might be helpful if I list some perfect square values down the side of the page here so that we can get good at recognizing when we have a difference of squares. Well, one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16. And if I keep going for the first 10 integers, here's a good list of perfect square values. If we recognize that what we have is a difference of perfect squares, we can use this factoring rule. And in this first example, I see that I have an x being squared minus a 25. But notice 25 is in our list. 25 is a perfect square value. 25 is actually a 5 squared. So I could rewrite this original expression as an x squared minus a 5 squared, which makes it more obvious that what we have is a difference of squares. So because it's a difference of squares, I know I can use this rule, where it's going to split into two factors. One of the factors is going to have a minus, the other one's going to have a plus. So I'll start by writing those two factors. And then in each of those factors on either side of the minus and plus signs are just going to be A and B, which represent 
the values that are being squared. So in this example, I'm just going to place an x and a 5 on either side of those minus and plus signs. So my factors are x minus 5 times x plus 5. And there's the factored form version of the original expression. Let me make it a bit smaller so we have room to do our next example. In this example, once again, the number 36 that I have, I recognize it from my list of perfect squares. 36 is a 6 squared. So I could rewrite this original expression as a 6x that's being squared minus a y that's being squared to make it obvious that what I have is a difference of squares. So I know this is going to split into two factors, one with a minus, one with a plus, and then on either side of those minus and plus signs go these values that are being squared. So my factors are 6x minus y and 6x plus y. Once again, let me make a bit of room and let's try our final example. The numbers that I see, 4 and 9, are both perfect square numbers. 4, I could think of that as a 2 being squared, minus this 9w squared, I could rewrite that as a 3w, all being squared. And now that I see that it's a difference of squares, I could write it in factored form. Using this 2 and this 3w, I know my two factors are 2 minus 3w and 2 plus 3w. And for any of these examples, if you were having trouble figuring out how we could rewrite any of the terms as a perfect square, notice that you could just square root each of those terms, and that would give you the numbers that go within each of the factors. Factoring method number six, factoring a perfect square trinomial. Let me start by showing you the rule. If you have a trinomial that's of this structure, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, this trinomial is called a perfect square trinomial because it factors nicely to a perfect square. It factors to a binomial squared, an a plus b, all squared. Now what's important to know about this structure is that the first and last terms are perfect squares, and the middle term is double the product of the two values that are being squared. So it's two times this a and b value. So if we have that exact structure, we're able to factor it to this binomial squared, where this a and b are the values that are being squared. And we could just get those values by square rooting the first and last terms, and that'll tell you what your a and your b are. And there's another version of this formula, where if we have an a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, that's also a perfect square trinomial because that trinomial also factors to a perfect square. It factors to a minus b squared. So let me show you two examples of perfect square trinomials. Let's start by looking at example one. It's a quadratic trinomial where the leading coefficient is one, so you could factor it by just finding numbers that multiply to nine and add to six. The numbers are 3 and 3, so this would factor to x plus 3 times another x plus 3, which you could rewrite just as a single factor of x plus 3 being squared. But let me show you how we could use our special rule to factor this as well. Start by noticing that the first term is a perfect square, it's an x squared, and the last term is also a perfect square, 9 is equal to 3 squared. And also, for it to be a perfect square trinomial, this middle term has to be 2 times the product of those values that are being squared. So it has to be equal to 2 times x times 3. And notice that 2 times x times 3 is equal to 6x. So because it has this exact structure that matches this structure, I know it would factor to a plus b squared, where a and b are just the square roots of the first and last terms. So I know this would factor to a single binomial that's being squared. And that single binomial would just be a sum of x and 3, because those are the square roots of x squared and 9. So it factors to x plus 3 squared. And then looking at example 2, this is also a perfect square trinomial, because the first term is a perfect square, it's an x squared, and the last term is also a perfect square. If we square root it, we get 4y. So I could rewrite that last term as a 4y being squared. And this middle term, I can rewrite that middle term 
as 2 times the product of the square root of the first and the square root of the last. So 2 times x times 4y. Notice that 2 times x times 4y is 8xy. So this is a perfect square trinomial, which means it factors to a binomial squared. And because this sign is minus, it meets this structure, which means my binomial is going to have a minus inside of it. And the values that go here and here are just the square root of the first and the square root of the last. They're the values that are being squared, x and 4y. So this will factor to x minus 4y squared. Factoring method number seven, a sum and difference of cubes. If you have a sum of two perfect cube values, so let's say we have an a cubed plus a b cubed, that's able to factor to a plus b multiplied by a squared minus a times b plus b squared. And if you have a difference of cubes, so if you have an a cubed minus a b cubed, that would factor to a minus b multiplied by a squared plus a b plus b squared. And you'll notice that these two rules look very similar, but their signs seem to be different in some places. There's actually an acronym that can help you remember what sign goes where. The acronym is SOAP, where the S stands for same, O stands for opposite, and then AP stands for always positive. And how this helps you remember the signs, well, notice if we have a sum of cubes where there's an addition between the perfect cube values, the first sign in our factored form is the same, it's also addition, but then the next sign is the opposite, it's negative. And then if we have a difference of cubes where we're subtracting the perfect cube values, the first sign in the factored form is the same, it's also subtraction, but the second sign is the opposite, it's addition. And then if you look at the third sign of both of them, the third signs are always positive. Now let's try a couple examples where you can practice using these rules to factor a sum and a difference of cubes. And before we factor these, it might be useful for me to write some perfect cube values off to the side so you're able to recognize when you have a perfect cube number. Well, one cubed is one, two cubed is eight, three cubed is 27, four cubed is 64, 5 cubed is 125, and so on. So if you see any of these values, know that what you have is a perfect cube number. So looking at example 1, I see that I have a difference of cubes. The first term is an x being cubed, and the second term, well that's 64, I could think of that as a 4 being cubed. So let me actually rewrite my original expression. I'll write it as an x cubed minus a 4 cubed so that you can see more obviously that we have a difference of cubes, which means I can follow this formula. But in place of a and b, I have x and four. So in this factored form expression, I'll change all of the a's to x and all of the b's to four. So now it's in factored form, but I could simplify inside of this factor. This x times four, we would typically write that as four x, and this four squared is 16. And then when you factor a sum or difference of cubes, this quadratic factor that you get is never going to be able to be factored any further. So this would be the final factored form of my difference of cubes. Factoring method number eight, factoring by substitution. Let's take a look at these two examples. Now for each of these expressions, there's no obvious way to factor them, but if I make a substitution, I could turn them both into a quadratic trinomial that I can apply my sum and product factoring methods to. Starting with the first one, I notice that this x to the 4 could be rewritten as an x to the 2 to the 2. And if you know your exponent rule as well, you would see that this and this are equivalent to each other. And the reason why I rewrite it like this is because if I make a substitution for x squared, let's say let k equal x squared. My new expression will be 2k squared minus 7k plus 3, which looks like a normal quadratic trinomial in standard form. It has an a, b, and c value, and since the a value is not 1 and can't be common factored out, I would have to factor this by decomposition. I would find a pair of numbers that have a product of a times c, so a product of 6, and a sum of the b value, negative 7. The numbers that satisfy that product in sum are negative 1 and negative 6. 
So I'll rewrite the expression, but split the middle term into negative 1k minus 6k. And then I can continue factoring by grouping. From the first group of two terms, I could common factor a k. And then from the last two terms, I would common factor a negative 3. And since I have this common binomial, I can common factor out that 2k minus 1, which would leave me with k minus 3 as my second factor. But remember, each of these k's are actually equal to x squared. So I can replace those k's with x squared, and then I have my factored form version of the original expression. And often students will ask, well, how would I recognize when to do this substitution, when to do that let statement? Well, if the degree of your first term is double the degree of your second term, you could change it into a quadratic by doing a substitution. And then looking over at example two, this one might be a little bit more obvious that it's a quadratic expression. If we just let x plus a equal a different variable, let's call it k, I would be able to rewrite this as k squared plus 3k plus 2. And this is a quadratic where the a value is just 1. So to factor it, I just need to find numbers who have a product of the c value and a sum of the b value. The numbers that satisfy that product and sum are 2 and 1, which means I can go right to my factored form of k plus 2 times k plus 1. But remember, these k's are actually equal to x plus a. So I'll replace them with x plus a, and then I have my final factored form of the original expression. Factoring method number nine, long division. Long division is a tool that's going to allow you to factor polynomial functions. But before we can do that, you have to learn two theorems, the factor theorem and the rational zero theorem. The factor theorem states that x minus b is a factor of the polynomial function p of x if p at b equals zero. This is just a special case of something called the remainder theorem, which tells you if you take whatever makes a divisor b zero, so what makes x minus b b zero is if x was b, if you take that value b and sub it into your polynomial function, it gives you the remainder. So if we take the zero of x minus b, which is b, sub it into our polynomial function and get zero, we know the remainder, if we divide it by x minus b, is zero, meaning it is a factor of the polynomial function. And the rational zero theorem tells us that if p at b over a equals zero, then b is a factor of the constant term, and a is a factor of the leading coefficient. And this rule will make more sense as we do an example, but what it's going to be useful for is helping us kind of guess and check as zero of the polynomial. So let's have a look at this polynomial and try and factor it. Now notice this polynomial is degree three. So our factoring methods for when we factor quadratics is not going to work. We could start by checking for a common factor between all four terms, but there are no common factors. And if you tried factoring by grouping, taking a common factor from the first group and from the last group, you're not going to get a common binomial. So factoring by grouping won't work either, leaving us with our only option of using long division to be able to factor that polynomial expression. But we have to decide, what are we going to divide that polynomial by? We have to find a factor of this polynomial. And to find a factor of that polynomial, we're first going to find a value that makes the function be zero. But we don't have to guess just any number. We know that if there is a rational value that makes it be zero, the numerator is going to be a factor of the constant, so a factor of 2, and the factors of 2 are plus or minus 1 and 2, and the denominator of that fraction is a factor of the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is 3, and factors of 3 are plus or minus 1 and 3. So I can make a complete list of the possible rational zeros of this function. And to make that list, I take each of the factors of the constant term, and divide them by each of the factors of the leading coefficient. So I have to do 1 divided by both 1 and 3. So I'll have plus or minus 1 or 1 over 3. And then I also have to do this 2 divided by both 1 and 3, which gives me 2 and 2 over 3. Now, since this is a degree 3 polynomial function, I know it's going to have three zeros based on the fundamental theorem of algebra. But some of those zeros might be repeated, some of them might be irrational, and some of them might even be imaginary. But if it has any rational zeros, I know they could be found in this list. We just have to hopefully find one of these eight numbers that makes this be zero, 
And that will allow us to figure out what a factor of that polynomial is. So we could just test them one by one until we find one that makes it be zero. If you were to sub one in for these x's, you would get zero. So basically we found some value that makes the polynomial be zero, which means the factor that has that value as it's zero must be a factor of the polynomial. What factor has a zero of one? That would be the factor x minus one. So x minus one is a factor of our polynomial. So I know I'm going to be able to split this polynomial into a product of x minus one and whatever the quotient is when I divide this polynomial by x minus one. And that's where long division comes in handy. I now need to actually do the division. I have to do this polynomial divided by x minus one. So I can set up my division table and I'll do it off to the side. And now with my division table, I can find my quotient. The process we go through is we take the first term of the dividend, 3x cubed, and divide it by the first term of the divisor, x. 3x cubed divided by x, using our exponent rules, is 3x squared. And I can write that up in the quotient. I then multiply that 3x squared by the whole divisor and write the product down here in the dividend lined up with its like terms in columns. 3x squared times x is 3x cubed, and 3x squared times negative 1 is negative 3x squared. I then subtract all of the like terms that I have in the dividend, those terms would cancel, and then 2x squared minus negative 3x squared is 5x squared. And then I can bring down the remaining terms that I still have in the dividend and repeat the process. First term of the dividend divided by first term of the divisor. 5x squared divided by x is 5x. Multiply that 5x by all of x minus 1 to get 5x squared minus 5x. And then we can subtract the like terms. These terms will cancel, and negative 7 minus negative 5 is negative 2. So I have negative 2x, and then bring down that 2. And we repeat the process one more time. This negative 2x gets divided by x to give negative 2. And then multiply that negative 2 by the entire divisor to get negative 2x plus 2. And then let me actually shrink this a bit so we have some room. And then when subtracting my like terms in the dividend, I see that I have a remainder of 0, which means x minus 1 divides evenly into that polynomial, which allows us to rewrite this polynomial as a product of x minus 1 and its quotient. And when factoring a polynomial, you should always fully factor it. This factor is a quadratic trinomial. We might be able to factor that further if we can find numbers that have a product of a times c and a sum of b. The numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add to 5 are 6 and negative 1. So I would split the middle term and then factor by grouping. And here's our final factored form of the original polynomial. Factoring method number 10, synthetic division. This is a shortcut that can be used when dividing a polynomial by a binomial of the form x minus b, which means you have a linear divisor with a leading coefficient of 1. So this is an alternate method to having to do long division when dividing a polynomial by a binomial, but it can only be used if your divisor has a leading coefficient of 1 and its degree 1. So let's try an example where we factor another polynomial. When asked to factor any type of expression, you should first check for a common factor, which this does not have. It has an even number of terms, so you could try factoring by grouping. But if you take a common factor from the first two and the last two, you won't get a common binomial, so that won't work. And when that happens, you're left with dividing this polynomial by a factor of it. But we have to find a factor of it by first writing a list of possible zeros. Since the leading coefficient is 1, the possible rational zeros of this function are just factors of the constant term. The factors of negative 8 are plus or minus 1, 2, 4, and 8. So if this function has any rational zeros, they'll actually be integers that are in this list. Hopefully we can find one that makes it be 0. And in fact, if I replaced all the x's with negative 1, I would get 0, which means the binomial which has a 0 of negative 1 is a factor of the polynomial. Well, x plus 1 has a 0 of negative 1, so x plus 1 is a factor of the polynomial, which will allow us to split this polynomial into a product of x plus 1 and whatever the quotient is when I divide this polynomial by x plus 1. Since this divisor of x plus 1 has a leading coefficient 1 
and degree 1, I can use my new shortcut method of synthetic division. And let me show you what that looks like. Off to the side, I'll set up a synthetic division table. I write the zero of my divisor here. So negative 1 makes x plus 1 be 0, so that goes here. And then I write the coefficients of my dividend across the top, which will be 1, 3, negative 6, and negative 8. I'm going to put a couple operator symbols here. And then I'll show you the algorithm for how we find the quotient. You bring the first number down, and then you find the product of that number and that number. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. And then we add these numbers in this column. 3 plus negative 1 is 2. And then we just repeat that process. Negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. Adding these numbers gives you negative 8. And then negative 1 times negative 8 is 8. And adding these numbers gives you 0. And then these numbers across the bottom here are actually the quotient and the remainder. Going from right to left through the numbers, the first number is the remainder, which is 0. That's good. That means that x plus 1 divides evenly into that polynomial. And we knew that would happen based on what we did up here. And then the rest of the numbers are the coefficients of each of the terms in the quotient. The negative 8 is the coefficient of the x to the 0 term. And then 2 is the coefficient of x to the 1 and so on. It keeps going up by one degree each time. So my quotient, looking here, is 1x squared plus 2x minus 8. And don't forget we should fully factor this. Since this is a quadratic factor, we could try and factor it by finding the proper sum and product numbers. Since the a value of this quadratic is 1, I just need to find numbers that have a product of negative 8 and a sum of 2. Those numbers are for negative 2, so I could split that quadratic into x plus 4 times x minus 2. And there's the final factored form. One tip I want to give you when doing this method of synthetic division is make sure the numbers you write across the top here, the coefficients of the dividend, make sure your dividend, the original polynomial, is written in proper order, meaning the terms are in descending order based on their degree. Right, we have degree 3, 2, 1, and then our degree zero term, so they're in proper order. And also, if you were missing a term, so let's say there was no 3x squared term here, we would have to fill in a placeholder for that missing term by putting a zero in that spot. If you watch to the end of this video, hopefully you feel comfortable factoring all different types of expressions now. Before leaving the video, make sure to leave a comment about what you want to see a top 10 about next. Jensen,